Mabuhai, kamusta kayo? It's great to be with the churches in the Philippines, and I'm so excited to be with you, even though we're across an ocean, to be able to talk to you today wherever you're at, whether you're in Manila or Quezon City or one of the islands. My name is Rob Skinner. I spent about 10 years in Japan in the 90s from 1993 to 2003 and visited the Philippines quite a few times. I'm so inspired by the churches there, by the disciples, the leaders. The work that you're doing is being heard around the world. The work that God is doing through you is inspiring people around the world. You know, I'm inspired. I want to imitate. I want to do great things for God. I, I, I think about the future. I'm 55 now. I've been a disciple for over 30 years, and I still have big dreams, and I hope you do too. I hope you've got a dream to, to make a huge difference in your life. It was really awesome to interview Bong, Norberto Aquino III, for my podcast, the Rob Skinner Podcast, and just to talk to him about how he became a Christian. And then he was an athlete. He was a, a basketball player in college, and he became a Christian. And just the dreams that he had for the kingdom of God and how he's seen those fulfilled, how he's done a, a triathlon, an Ironman competition. And as we were talking, it just, it just fired me up, and he invited me to come and speak to you today. And so here I am. And as I think about my dreams for the kingdom of God, I think, man, I want, I want my life to make a difference. I want to do as much as I can before I die. When I, when I die, I want to look back and go, man, I, I poured it all out. I gave everything I had to serve God. I saved as many people as possible. You know, I've got some dreams. I'm going to share them with you. I think one of my dreams is I want to plant 10 churches, 10 or more churches in the next 10 or so years. I'll be 65 in 10 years, and I think, man, I'd love to see that happen, 10 new churches planted. I've got a dream to plant, to appoint 10 or more evangelists in the next 10 years. That would be awesome. I'd love to see young men raised up and then women's ministry leaders appointed by my wife. I've also got a dream to save 10 or more souls in the next 10 years. I want to be fruitful. I want to I want to see people becoming Christians right and left. One of the greatest moments of my life was I was working in Tokyo in the ministry and I went sharing and it had been a long time since I'd helped someone become a Christian and I was just praying, God, please, 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 please let me meet someone who's open. And on the train platform, I saw this woman and I went up to her and I, I said, excuse me, I thought she was Japanese, but she was Filipina. Her name was Maribel. And Maribel was open and I started studying the Bible with her. I studied about halfway through and then I turned it over to the sisters and she became a Christian. And she ended up meeting a brother, uh, marrying a brother in our ministry. His name was Francel Manila. And now they're living in San Francisco. They're still faithful. But it was one of the most awesome, awesome things for me to see her become a Christian and to see her stay faithful throughout all these years. So I've got a great connection with, with the Filipino church, and I'm so happy to be with you today. As I think about my dreams, I think, man, I'd love to do that. But then reality sets in, and I go, that's not going to happen. <laughs> There's just no way. When I look at my sinful nature, when I look at the way I think, when I look at my limitations, my laziness, and my sin, I go, that's probably not going to happen. As long as I think the way that I currently think. As long as I stay the same way I am today. But as I started to dream, I thought, Rob, if you're ever going to even approach those dreams for the kingdom of God, you're going to have to become an entirely different person. The old Rob Skinner will never be able to accomplish those things. Those are way, way too challenging. But then I thought, what would it take for me to change and be different? I thought, what if Jesus were here physically? He'd do it easy. What if Paul were here? Oh, yeah, no problem. But where I'm at, I go, no, it's not going to happen. And then I thought, you know what needs to change? I've got to change the way I think. 
When I'm talking to disciples who've been disciples 10, 20, even 30 years, the church in Manila has been there since 1989. It's been there a long time. And one of the biggest challenges is we get into ruts in our thinking. We think the same way over and over, and we don't examine how do I view God? And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that if you want to do things differently, if you want to do more for God and see miracles happen, you're going to have to change what goes on inside here. Your faith, the way you think, the way you view God, it's going to have to change entirely. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk about the miracle of grace. Let's start reading in the Bible. And we're going to take a look at the parable of the workers in the vineyard. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a land, landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard came to his foreman, called the workers and paid them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now I'm sure you've read this passage before, but how does this passage strike you? Doesn't it seem a little bit unfair? Doesn't it seem a little weird? It doesn't seem right, does it? You go, wait a second. I mean, if they work less, then they should probably be paid less. And that's exactly how you should feel. You should feel a little bit like, what? That's weird. Something seems off about it. The people who worked hard all day should get more. And the people who only worked a little bit should get paid much less. Yet the landowner decided to just do a flat pay system. Basically, everyone gets the same amount no matter whether they worked a little or a lot. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this story. He says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. We're often like the people scratching their heads and wondering, why does God work this way? God's, generate, God's generosity, or his grace, the term we often use, it's one of the toughest concepts to understand and to internalize. I mean, we hear it a lot. I mean, we, we talk about God's grace and we can say it. But to really get it, to really understand it, and to really feel it, that's a totally different issue. It's also one of the most important issues if you want to grow as a disciple. I've had a number of conversations this past week about this same topic. I've talked to people and they, they just don't get it. They feel like one person felt like that unless they checked off all the boxes, that they would confessed their sin, they'd had a quiet time, they'd, they'd done everything just right, they'd, they'd you know, just done everything on their religious list possible, then 
then they weren't pleasing God if they didn't do exactly what they were set, set out to do. They've got a, a spiritual habit that they want to stick to. And one person felt like they wondered if God still loved them after they had struggled and been angry toward God in the past. They'd been disappointed and they were upset. Well, then God finally came through and they're wondering, is God still mad at me because I, I was upset with him? One person felt like they understood grace only in theory. Now, understanding God's generosity to us, I believe, is job number one. It is like your most important job as a disciple. Because it's the power source for all Christians. When you don't get it or apprehend, that's what the word Martin Luther uses, which means understand the meaning of something, it robs your Christian life of power because you misunderstand God and you feel like he's not very generous. He's just kind of a, a lawgiver. So how can we get it? How can we get the generosity of God? Number one, don't believe everything that you think. Don't believe everything that you think. In Jeremiah chapter 17, in verse 9, Jeremiah writes this. He says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We assume that the way we view the world is the only way and the right way to view the world. And that's just how the world goes. These workers allowed envy and jealousy and comparison and greed to cloud their thinking about the owner. They never factored in the possibility that the landowner was going to be generous. I mean, it just didn't make sense. They thought, wait a second, that, no, that's not right. And we've all had weird thoughts swirl in our head about God that doesn't give much credit to who God is. We have negative thoughts about us. We have negative thoughts about God. We've got inaccurate thoughts about how this world runs. And they're altered by our personal history, our desires, our weaknesses, and our sins. And they're often so far from being accurate. You know, on a personal level, I've got a, a close relative who adopted two kids from Korea. And they, they were adopted when they were six and eight. And they had a lot of challenges growing up. They were very angry. They, especially when they got into their teens and into their college years, they, they would tell my, my relative, you know, we hate you. You don't love us. You don't care about us. They, they just tr treated her terrible. Even though she poured so much love into them and she poured so much money and time and would tell them over, I love you, you're my son and daughter. Well, a lot of it comes from, didn't have anything to do with who she was, but it had to do with their thinking about their past. You see, before my relative picked them up out of the orphanage, what had happened is their mother, their Korean mother, had taken them into the orphanage. And the reason why is she was, she had divorced her first husband and she was marrying a new husband. But the new husband would not accept these kids from her previous family. And so he told her, he said, it's either me or these kids. These kids have got to go. So what the mother did is she walked into the orphanage she sat the kids down, and then she told them, she said, Okay, you kids, just stay right here. I'm going to go to the bathroom. So the kids waited and waited and waited, and they waited and they waited. And she never came back. They never saw their mother again. You see, that left a scar on the way they thought about parents and about their mother. And even though 
my relative who adopted them, loved them and just cried for them. Because of their thinking, they could never comprehend this person really loves me. Why? Because they were scarred by that horrific situation with their real mother. And in the same way, a lot of times we've got these weird thoughts about God. He doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. He hates me. He'll never forgive me for what I've done in the past. He despises me. He's going to punish me. And a lot of these come from situations that have nothing to do with God. He loves us. He's like, I love you so much. I think you're awesome. But we won't accept when we say, you hate me. You're going to leave me. You're going to abandon me. It has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with the weird thinking and the crazy thinking that goes on in our mind. So don't believe everything you think. Even though you think it, that doesn't mean that's really the way this world should run or the way God is. You're going to have to examine your thinking and go, wait a second. I'm going to have to take captive that thought and make it obedient to Christ. Because God does love me in spite of what I think and how I feel. Second thing, if we want to understand the generosity of God, we've got to be careful about mind reading. Mind reading. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes this. He says, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. We often make mistakes when we try to guess the thoughts of people, and especially God. Why people do and say the things they do. These, we make a lot of mistakes when we try to mind read. Well, that person is doing this because here's what they're thinking. Now, you see this a lot in the news about politicians. Oh, he's doing this because he hates this group of people, or because he's racist, or because he's a hater, or whatever. And people will mind read and say, oh, this is what he's thinking. But that kind of mind reading is so often inaccurate. It says no one knows the mind of man except the person's spirit within them. We, we can't tell what a person's actually thinking. And we're, in fact, science has proven that we're terrible at it. We make mistakes right and left. But how much more God? You know, so often people walk away from church and it's because of mind reading. Oh, well, that leader doesn't love me because he didn't give me a hug in the fellowship and I know he hates me. Well, you don't know that. That person could have just been having a bad day and you're doing mind reading. Well, this person thinks this way about me and so he did this. You don't know. You can't mind read. We try to mind read God. But the Bible says no one knows the mind of God except the Spirit. You see, you don't know, you don't know the mind of God. Now, you've got a little bit of ins insight since you became a Christian because the Spirit lives inside of you. But you got to be careful because God is so much greater than we are that without the Spirit's help and the Bible, we don't know the mind of God. He is so superior to us in every way. And so what we try to do is we, we think, you know, if something happens in our life, we go, well, just that just shows God hates me. That's what he's been thinking. Or God's upset with me. Or God did this to me today because I sinned yesterday. I did this or maybe two years ago or I, I, I did this terrible thing when I was a teenager and now it's coming back to haunt me because God's upset or God's being unfair here or God won't forgive me for that one sin. You don't know the mind of God except what's been revealed by his word. We just have to be humble and accept that. We often judge God based on what's happening most recently in our lives. Maybe things are going good. We go, oh, God loves me. And then we have a terrible time, maybe a financial crisis. We go, God hates me. You don't know. 
be careful. I love this story from Stephen Covey. He shares about a time he was riding on the subway in New York City. And he said, it was a Sunday morning on a subway in New York City. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some resting with their eyes closed. It was a calm, peaceful scene. Then suddenly, a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed. The man, the man sat down to, next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing. And yet the man sitting next to me did nothing at all. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that he could be so insensitive to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else on the subway felt irritated also. So finally, with what I felt was an unusual amount of patience and restraint, I turned to him and I said, Sir, your, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little bit. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, Oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't, I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Can you imagine what I felt at that moment? My, my way of thinking, my paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things totally differently. I felt differently. I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with a man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife just died? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? Everything changed in an instant. If we're gonna change our behavior if we're going to change who we are and how we act, and if we want to be more loving and have more faith, we're going to have to change the way we view this world and the way we view God. Because a lot of times we're working under a false assumption, just like this man in the story. He thought, why are these kids going nuts? But when he understood what had really happened, all of a sudden everything changed. And the day you figure out that God is generous, loving, and loves you with more passion than you can even imagine or describe, it's going to totally change everything you do and why you do it. We need a major change in our view of God. Don't believe everything you think. Take a look at your thoughts and go, wait a second, that's not a good thought. I don't know where that comes from, but I'm not going to think that way anymore. And two, don't try to mind read people or God. It often leads to false assumptions. Do the spiritual work to develop a healthy trust in his attitude toward us. This is why Paul prayed this prayer for all of us. In Ephesians 3, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, verse 14, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I love this passage because Paul shares, he says, listen, I could pray for you about a lot of different things, but here's the thing I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray that you understand the depth of God's love for you. Because one, you need power to understand it. It's, it's not easy. There's a lot of forces working against us to try to keep us 
away from understanding how generous God really is. We're like those people in the story we read at the very beginning. We're like, why is God doing that? It's not fair. And we never think, whoa, God is really generous toward me. But he says, I want you to have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, when you understand how much God loves you, all of a sudden your character changes, your personality changes, your motivation changes, and all of a sudden you start looking and acting so much more like Jesus than ever before. You want to share your faith. You want to serve. You want to live for God with a passion. And isn't that how we're going to change this world? It's not going to be because someone told us to do it. It's because instead it's going to be like, I want to do this because my God is so generous and loving to me. That's the miracle of God's grace. And brothers and sisters, whether you're in the Philippines or right here in Arizona in the United States, it's job number one. And I want to implore you to take the time, make the effort to really dig in and think about the generosity of God. You know, I've been doing a lot of work on this myself, just like I shared at the beginning. And what I do in the morning is I'll sit down and I've got a lot of things I'm worried about. You know, my kids, my wife, my family, the church. And if I'm not careful, that's all I'll pray about. I'll just pray, oh, God, I need help here. I need help. Oh, God, help me with this. You know, thanks for a couple things, but here's I need help with this. What I'm forcing myself to do is read passages about God's love, about His grace, and then just meditating on the power, the love, the greatness of God, and forcing myself for periods of time, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, just to think about that. And think, man, I am so loved. I'm so saved. I'm so forgiven. Because you know why? It's not natural. That's not natural for me to think that way. And I need power. And I'm asking the Spirit, Spirit, help me to understand the depth of God's love for me. Because I know that as I grow in that area, I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow into the image of Jesus Christ, into his maturity, into his the full measure of all the fullness of God. And I want the same thing for you. So take that deliberate practice. Work on your weak points. Focus on the areas, the negative thoughts. Drive them out and replace them with positive thoughts, spiritual thoughts about the generosity and love of God. So let me leave you a couple next steps. Counter negative thoughts with a Bible promise. Counter negative thoughts with a Bible promise. And two, ask God to fill you with a spirit to grasp or get God's love, to really understand the depth of his love for you. I know God loves you so much, and I love you too. And I'm going to be praying for the work in the Philippines. You're inspiring me and, the, and around the world with all your plantings and going out to all the different provinces. It's awesome. And I want to imitate you. But I want to ask you to pray for me that I understand through the Spirit the depth of God's love for me. Love you guys so much. Have a great Christmas. Bye-bye.